Yeah, we All are right. recording. So just for the sake of the interview, can um, you give a brief introduction on who you are and what you do? Yeah, uh, my name is David Rovix. I'm a singer-songwriter from Portland, Oregon, and I write mostly about history and and uh, social movements and things that are happening in news and sort of topical, what they call topical or protest songs, depending on who's defining these things. Just curious, are you a IWW red card holder? I am indeed dues paying <laughs> current dues paying member <laughs> with the Olympia branch for some reason. I live in Portland, but I I registered in <laughs> Olympia, so I used to live in Olympia. So you're you're basically just a modern version of Joe Hill. I um yeah, I mean I'm doing the same kind of thing that Joe Hill was doing but a lot less uh, union organizing. I mean Yeah. <laughs> He was in a certain time at a certain place in time where the labor, the radical labor movement was was massive. And uh, if if the radical labor movement were big the, now the way it was then, I like I, I believe I would be swimming in it. I mean, I'd love to be involved with that. <laughs> but I get involved with uh, you know movements that I can plug into that are actually happening now. Although my fantasy would be to be involved with a huge oh, IWW. <laughs> I know that's the dream. So, you, uh, besides being a musician, you're also pretty big on history, and that's why many of your songs are about his historical movements, historical people. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So, before you, when you first started your songwriting, would you say that Hill had an uh, impact on you and impact on how you write your songs yeah when i first let's see when did so i first heard about joe hill well i mean i guess i heard about him earlier but i first really sort of heard about him in the sense of like really understanding his position in history when i first read about the industrial workers of the world and, and that was when i first read Howard Zinn's book, A People's History of the United States. That was uh, when it came out, I believe, in 1981. I, I think I read it pretty soon after it came out, and that was the first time I had ever heard of the IWW. And, um, <clears throat> and I remember that specifically because it just had a tremendous impact on me. I mean, the whole book was so well written and, and such a great sort of introduction to U.S. history. But the stuff about the IWW was just so exciting. It's like you can't really tell the history of the IWW without it being an exciting because it was just <laughs> crazy how much was going on. Right. And that was uh, so then I started getting into songwriting, I guess, around the same time that I was reading that book. So, um, but probably, and which was then also around the same time that I also discovered uh, soon after reading that book, uh, Utah Phillips, <clears throat> Utah Phillips and, and his um, album, uh, Utah Phillips uh, tells the stories or sings the songs and tells the stories of the industrial <laughs> workers of the world. Just fantastic album. I know. And then another one that I found, uh, which was somehow in the same, you know, if you were looking for that, if you find Utah Phillips stuff, you were likely to find other stuff like um, this album uh, of uh, Joe, a collection of Joe Hill songs that was put together, I think, by Flying Fish Records, maybe, or Rounder Records, one of those little folk labels. And it was um, also lots of lots of his songs. So, but the thing is that uh, the, th the thing is about talking about Joe Hill or uh, his songwriting or how they influence me is that it's really almost impossible to say because the problem is that it comes like it's like the baby that's within the bathwater of not that any of it should be thrown out but it is <laughs> like it is like the fish swimming in the sea it's like the iww i mean joe hill was just one of several prominent songwriters and and popular educators and cartoonists who were involved with the IWW and published regularly in IWW publications. And, you know, so his, so he was just part of this. You can't really, once you, when you discover Joe Hill, unless you discovered Joe Hill only by hearing Joan Baez singing about him in Woodstock and you didn't look further than that. Like I knew <laughs> about him because of that. Like, cause I heard Woodstock, I heard the, I saw the Woodstock movie and heard the Woodstock album 
when I was still a, probably 12 years old or something. So it's long before I ever sort of learned about the IWW. I knew who Joe Hill was just from that Joan Baez, you know, rendition, which I, you know, always loved, but knew nothing about him otherwise. But, but generally when you hear about Joe Hill, it's going to come in the context of hearing about the IWW and hearing about other songwriters and other music that was happening at coming out of that movement so you know i so I, I, it's hard to say but that but what i can say you know for sure is that all the move all the movement music of the time whether it's joe hill ralph chaplin t-bone slim haywire mac mcclintock or a little later woody guthrie you know th those all those all those radical songwriters of that period uh, were hugely influential for me and a lot of other people. But I think you might have that same problem asking that question of a lot of other left-wing um, musicians. What is specifically the influence of Joe Hill? Like, how do you pick that apart from the influence yeah. of Ralph Chaplin? You know? So you're a, you're a Portland art artist. You play mainly in Portland, Oregon. And no, I'm and I live in Portland and I play mainly in Europe. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, since you live in Portland, uh, how much uh, would you say is the IWW's presence there, or just not in general, left-wing activism? Because that's one of the hot spots in the country. The IWW has a very long-standing presence in Portland. Joe Hill was registered in the Portland IWW, as was uh, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, one one of the leaders of the IWW, and um, <clears throat> also John Reed, the, uh, another IWW member who wrote the book ten, "The Ten Days uh, That Shook the World" about the Russian Revolution. He was also a Portlander and. Um, so the the radical history of radical labor and the, especially the longshore workers and the conflict on the docks and and um, that goes way back and and in, in the logging camps organizing in the logging camps and this was the capital of the logging industry of the northwest. So that goes way back and I mean in recent uh, months I think people who've been paying a lot of attention to Portland have been hearing about the protests against police brutality and other protests and people also have probably been hearing about the history of Oregon as a white homeland and as a uh, institutionally racist uh, state from the very beginning and all of that is true it's all real it's all part of Portland and the reason why the uh, protests have been as uh, intense as they have been here, I think, has uh, a lot to do with a lot of different potential factors. And, and, it, and I would say actually one of them is the fact that Portland is the most rent burdened city in the country. It is the most expensive place to live in the country relative to how much people make in terms of how much the slumlords are charging, like mine. But the, um, the, the city, so I mean, by some of my friends' informal estimates, among the people protesting downtown, probably half of them are housing insecure, which is not to detract in the least from their concern about police brutality or racism. But just to put it into context, I mean, you're not talking about people who are uh, oftentimes uh, taking time off from their busy work schedule to go protest. You know, these are people, who, uh, you know, in, in many cases who are unemployed and housing insecure, you know. So, I mean... But really, I think Portland's Portland being on the floor of these protests really has everything to do with the fact that it is contested ground. This is the whitest major city in the United States, and it has a history of fascists making their home here. And since the 1980s, with the rise of, uh, you know, I mean, as somebody said the civil rights movement never really made it to Portland in, in the 60s. It never really made it to Oregon. And I don't know exactly if that's in entirely accurate. I mean, that's it's a maybe a bit of an exaggeration, but I, I the po but point taken. It was never a major. There was never a major sort of black led civil rights movement in Portland because black people in the in port in Oregon are two percent of the population, you know, and and an overwhelming majority of black people in in Oregon live in Portland, and and still it's it's still black people are a very small minority in Portland as well, but in the eighties. Uh, things things started to pick up in Portland in terms of anti-racist 
activity. Anti-racist action was very active. I would say it's still overwhelmingly a white, you know, youth, uh, you know, organization. But s- at least it, in some forms, racism started to become something that was really on the agenda, you know, in Portland because of the because of the prevalence of skin of what of racist skinheads here in this town and uh you know they they were dominant on the streets and that changed um and and it was and it changed because of conflict physical conflict and um that and by the 90s uh they were leaving uh the, the racists were leaving uh town in terms of organized institutional sort of you know organized racists were leaving portland because it was no longer friendly territory for them and they, but they're still here. They're still around. They they just moved to the suburbs, or they moved to Idaho. Like they didn't go far away. So, you seem to be really enthusiastic about just the history and um, just trying to organize your city of Portland and try to just make it better with your activism. So, would you say that some of your songs that you write are tart? What's the intention behind some of the songs that you write? I mean, definitely in terms of like, I mean, normally I'm before the pandemic, you know, I spend about half my time traveling and playing music and I used to tour in the U S a lot and I would like to continue to be doing that. But I, started only touring in Europe because that's the only way I could pay the bills because of the economics of being a musician these days. And um, so, uh, but, uh, you know, it's especially since the pandemic hit, I, you know, I haven't left Oregon uh, since March and, and I haven't, um, yeah. <laughs> and I have bar- I've barely left the port. I've barely left Portland. You know, I mean, the furthest road trip I've taken since March was to get away from the fires uh, you know, all the smoke. And, and for, to do that, I, I drove, we drove two hours <laughs> to, to the coast, <laughs> to a town called Astoria. So we just, you know, I mean, this is the least traveling I've done in my entire adult life. And um, so, but that's been really cool uh, to be uh, rooted in a place. And, and, you know, I always try to be part of a place that I'm living in, in terms of writing about it and, and actively involved with protests and whatever else. But, since last March and not leaving at all, it's been a new degree of, of, of rootedness, I guess you could say. And I've been trying to get involved, not just with writing about what's happening um, and singing at protests, but also with uh, trying to do a little bit of organizing. And I, I'll be the first to admit that I'm no good at it and I have no experience <laughs> at it, you know, and it's very different from songwriting, but I'm trying to uh, do some ev- ev- eviction resistance uh, organizing in terms of like the, preparing for the wave of evictions that it, that is going to be coming and there's a lot of different groups doing this kind of organizing all over the place and i love the way it's happening all over the place in decentralized ways and i just thought well i i'm just gonna i'm just gonna be part of that uh sort of effort to organize decentralized networks of eviction defense uh, squads because um what seems to be clearly happening is they're all networked. The networks are networked, and and uh, when the shit hits the fan, um, everybody's going to be responding to the same evictions, regardless of which network they've organized themselves into. You know, kind of like with affinity groups or something. You know. So are you trying to uh, through your music? Are you trying to inspire people to be more active? Are you trying to just put more activism issues out there? Yeah, so I would say that basically the role that my music plays is very much the same kind of role that other um, music from this tradition plays, whether you're talking about Joe Hill or The Clash or Public Enemy. I mean, regardless, it's all basically topical music about current events in history, and it it serves the purpose of uh, popular education so that people can learn about things that they didn't know about before or learn more about things that they didn't know so much about. But it, uh, it also plays the, I think, really important role of reaching people on an emotional level because music has that particular power, which has actually been proven by scientists a few years ago. There was a study, and you know, I, I, there's one of these things I just... 
already knew and all the musicians already knew, but it was nice to have it proven that uh, when you sing words, they go to the emotional centers of the brain. They get processed differently from when you speak words. And um, I think that's one of the many reasons why songs can be very powerful as a means of communicating a story because you can communicate the emotion behind it in a way that is much more difficult to do without uh, music. Um, I think film can do that really uh, well, but it's um, it's tricky to to really sort of transport people to the place you're trying to bring them to, and music can can do that. So, tool for popular education, a tool for taking people out of their own skin and putting them into somebody else's skin for a few minutes, and and hopefully uh, allowing them to have sometimes a, a transformational you know, profound experience um, as they might have if they actually went somewhere like traveled uh, somewhere that they have never been to that's the idea anyway and I think it, it can work so it's it, it serves different purposes but it also it also very importantly serves the purpose of um, of uh, bringing community together um, you know of uh, of um, fostering a sense of community and, and sort of helping people to feel like they're part of something. So because of your nature and being very activism pro person, have you ever been to a specific strike where you heard Hills music being played or sung? A, a particular, um, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, but many, many, many. I mean, basically, uh, I mean, it's just very common uh, that that uh, at any kind of labor related event uh, that at some point uh, you're going to hear uh, one of Joe Hill's songs. Um, and uh, it's even more uh, likely that you're going to hear uh, multiple songs by his <laughs> contemporaries as well, you know, because they all come together. You're going to hear somebody sing Preacher and the Slave uh, by Joe Hill, and you're going to hear definitely somebody sing uh, Solidarity Forever uh, by Ralph Chaplin. Uh, you know, you're, 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 depending on how many wobbly geeks are around, then you, you know, you might hear other songs like there's power in a union. If, if you got, especially any Billy Bragg fans, which is also <laughs> another Joe Hill song uh, that, that was, that he was much more popularized by Billy Bragg than by Joe Hill himself. I think uh, actually many more people know the song because of Billy Bragg. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of songs from that period, including Joe Hill songs that you'll hear at any kind of, gathering of a labor related gathering for most in, in in the u.s if there's people who are sort of culturally oriented at all i mean the the thing is that the labor movement uh by and large uh, has uh it's it's nothing like what it used to be in in the u.s uh, and of course in other countries it's it's very thriving vibrant massive you know central part of society but in in the u.s it's it's so marginal at this point and then um a lot of the culture of the labor movement that uh, has been exported around the world from the united states uh has not been passed down within the united states so um you know you'll find like gather small gatherings of radicals like wobblies and stuff they'll be totally up on the the music uh that that's part of this cultural history the in political cultural history but uh it, it, like if you're going to a, like a labor day picnic sponsored by a local afl cio branch it's still quite likely that somebody will be singing IWW songs at some point if anybody's doing live music, but it's not a guarantee. There's no guarantee about that by any means. Yeah. It's, it's uh, and it's often the case that if they have music, which they usually would, you know, it's going to be like something completely apolitical and, and maybe they, uh, maybe whoever, whatever band they've got there has, you know, makes an effort to learn one union song for the occasion. Maybe they do, <laughs> maybe they don't, you know, somebody, some organizer will get up and sing solidarity forever at some point, you know, uh, even if the band isn't doing it, but, um, you know, and they may or may not ever know or say anything about the IWW or the association with the song and the union, and and probably Joe Hill's name won't get mentioned, but even if one of his songs might get sung, I mean it's it's a it's a mishmash. It's a we're not a it's it hasn't been a 
these these things have not been passed down in any kind of like systematic way at summer camp at communist summer camp the way they used to get passed down <laughs> the way they still do get passed down <laughs> in like sweden or denmark you know but in in the us we don't have that infrastructure anymore there's only actually one communist summer camp left that i know of and and there used to be dozens you know and i mean and now it sounds like a joke when i say communist summer <laughs> camp like, yeah but that used to be a thing you know i mean the communist party had millions of members and they all they they put on uh camps in the summers for both uh for families and for children and um you know they <clears throat> they were all over the catskills in western massachusetts and other parts of the country including e even you know tennessee so, like you mentioned earlier, you play a lot in Europe and you're a traveling musician. And obviously Hill is gonna, and the IWW songs are gonna have an impact in Sweden. But have you noticed uh, an impact of IWW songs anywhere else in Europe? Yes, um, definitely. Uh, I mean, in Sweden, because Jo Emanuel Heglund was from Sweden and Gefle from uh, north of <laughs> Stockholm, beautiful little town, uh, and, and his home where he grew up has been perfectly preserved. It's a wonderful museum and place to visit. Uh, he was one of eleven kids, so it's a, you know, not a big house for eleven kid family, but but it's a pretty nice big house to to visit if if anybody's ever in Gefle, in Sweden. <laughs> but uh, in in the sixties. The, a lot of people uh, were doing Joe Hill songs in Swedish in, in the folk revival, which was very much hand in hand in, in many countries uh, as with the U.S. It was a very political sort of musical revival in the 60s. And Joe Hill's songs got a new life in Sweden that they really hadn't had before the 60s. It was his music, I believe, as I understand it, was not especially well known in Sweden until the 60s, um, long after his death when a lot of his songs were translated into Swedish, some of them very badly translated into Swedish. <laughs> I, you know, I, I toured a lot with a Swedish uh, songwriter who was, who, was who was also a historian and, and really knowledgeable about Swedish labor history and Joe Hill. And, and he showed me some of these translations and uh, some of them are very bad, specifically rebel girl because rebel girl, uh, the term girl in English uh, as it was used at the time meant woman. Uh, or girl it was in, it could be could be either one but in the context of that song clearly he was he meant woman um and as it would be translated in contemporary english and um and but in the uh swedish uh it, the term woman and girl was really two different terms by uh, certainly by the 60s uh, as i understand it and so they translated girl literally as girl so in swedish it's young girl so then it to, to say the rebel <laughs> young girl it takes the whole meaning of the song like how could they even have done that i mean it's obviously a song about a woman but anyway um <laughs> so but he so but but then because of the because uh, because the uh the the radical labor movement that joe hill was a part of from the early 20th century in the u.s was hugely influential around the world i mean may day in the 1880s from the from the movement for the eight hour day in the united states the where when may 1st became international workers day on may 1st 1886 it, this became uh, as this was exported to the rest of the world. So the entire world still today celebrates May Day as International Workers' Day. It's just the only place they don't do that is the United States, pretty much. But um, and this was intentional. It was changed. It was moved to September to uh, so that we wouldn't be celebrating May Day on the same day as the <laughs> Russians. No, but then the uh, but but that whole May Day tradition and the whole tradition of the of the Wobblies uh, was it captured the imagination of people around the world and 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 had a tremendous influence on the global labor movement. So and Joe Hill uh, definitely uh, uh, you know in waves throughout the 20th century, just as he continued to have an influence on the labor on on the cultural milieu within the united states just as he was uh, revived as a concept in the 60s uh, by uh, the swedish uh, songwriters and also by joan baez and so many others and then just as his music was once again sort of revived in in new ways in the 80s by utah phillips and and um 
you know, it's um, and been by the resurgence of the IWW uh, since that time. Not that it's anything like it was, but it's it's grown uh, significantly compared to what it was in the eighties. And um, so all that has all that has had repercussions around the world to one degree or another. So it's definitely, um, I mean, wherever you find uh, radical labor people, you'll find one degree or another knowledge of, of Joe Hill, especially in English speaking countries or countries where English is a dominant second language, which is basically everywhere in Europe, but, but probably more in Northern Europe than in Southern Europe. If there's a, if, if Joe Hill has made his way into the sort of cultural sort of imagination of places in Southern Europe, more likely he made his way there through like latin america uh, but but it's a uh, it's all there's a lot of cross pollination and there's there's also been even in the days since joe hill in the decade in the decades since joe hill uh, there's been a lot of cross pollination between the folk revival of the united states um and and the folk revival in latin america so like like the nuevo cancion movement that that was that was and is a very big part of the sort of cultural milieu for at least a certain uh, significant segment of the population from mexico to argentina uh, you know that 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 whole movement has been influenced by pete seeger and woody guthrie very consciously and vice versa uh, you know, Pete Seeger, and it was was very consciously influenced by Nueva Canción, and and there, there's there's uh, lots of very open and you know not hidden <laughs> cross pollination, <laughs> and so Joe Hill would have worked his way into that as well, you know, um, because of his dominance in the folk music scene in the United States. So there's all kinds of weird, you know, ways that that the that you find his influence all over the place in in all kinds of ways where you don't. You, where you know that in many cases people don't even realize uh, that the influence is there, which is a wonderful thing because actually, even as hard as it is as it may be to research some of that influence, you when you know that you see the influence in ways that where people don't even know uh, that the influence is there, that it's a real. I mean, it's the kind of thing Joe Hill, I assume, would be very proud of as an artist because it's just the sort of thing he was trying to do, to become part of the culture, not to be shining a light on himself. He was <laughs> never trying to do that. So have you ever been to Salt Lake City or Utah? And because that's where Hill was executed and he lived his last years, is his uh, memory any different there than throughout the rest of the United States? Yeah, I mean, it is. And um, uh, certainly uh, that became, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure to how much that was true before 2015, but certainly in 2015 on the 100th anniversary of his execution, uh, there were uh, journalists like Jeremy Harmon uh, was doing just fantastic stuff in the Salt Lake City Tribune, wonderful series of articles uh, on the background of Joe Hill, really some of the best stuff out there, I think, anywhere uh, outside of or within academia that you can find on Joe Hill is the stuff that Jeremy Harmon has been doing for the Salt Lake Tribune. And really um, kind of interesting with, I don't know who owns the Salt Lake Tribune, but it was very interesting to see, like, at least when it comes to history, they were letting all kinds of great stuff, all kinds of radical perspective was in there. You know, I think, I think that's true with a lot of the press. Like if you're doing an article about history, you can get stuff in there a lot more easily than if you're doing stuff about contemporary politics, which are much more controversial, you know, <laughs> but definitely in Salt Lake city. I mean, for those who are paying attention, which is, you know, it's probably a small minority of the population, but uh, but but bigger minority than most cities. Uh, they are, uh, I'd say, for a lot of the people, they're still they're still uh, fighting the fight over, uh, you know, who who killed um, that shopkeeper that Joe Hill was accused of killing, and um, and and uh, who shot Joe Hill, and uh, th this is very much un uh, unfinished business for a lot of people in Salt Lake City. So. You've uh, you've seen a lot of different movements throughout history, and in your opinion, have as new generations start to protest and older generations start to stop the protest, have you seen that Hills uh, or the IWW's history is it being 
dropped with the younger generations or is it being renewed each generation? It is, um, I mean, I guess I'd say it's a, it's a mix of things, but um, it keeps on getting renewed, uh, not in any kind of like really, well, okay, I'd say I'd say in some places it it gets renewed in very systematic ways, and in other ways it gets renewed by freak accidents, which may not be such freak accidents. Maybe it's almost inevitable. But but I'd say like in places like Denmark and Sweden, uh, and I'm just mentioning places that I'm really familiar with, not because it's not happening elsewhere. It's just that those are places I can mention where 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 there's a real sort of intentional passing on of this kind of culture where people where kids go to summer camp uh, run by left wingers and they very intentionally are taught songs by Joe Hill and David Rovix actually and you know other you know songwriters they these kids grow up in Denmark going to these camps learning my songs learning Joe Hill's songs then um, you know by the time they're you know teenagers they're listening to me on Spotify and they're you know and you can see it in the statistics and so you know I know and I can see that my audience is remains young and continues to be young uh, oh no matter how much I get older and and some of these things are really easy to see because you can see it in the statistics on and that that Spotify and YouTube is nice enough to provide us with you know but um, so there is this there is this like clear passing on uh, of of culture that happens uh in and but i think uh, you know in, in some places where that's really intentional uh, also through good uh educational radio programming on on uh, you know s state broadcasters in some european countries that do really good educational you know stuff on history but uh it also gets passed down. The culture gets passed down by more sort of accidental ways. And I would say like one example of that is, is uh, the tremendous uh, influence that Billy Bragg uh, has had on culture, uh, both uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, um, you know, just by doing uh, it, it, songs about Joe Hill and songs by Joe Hill and songs about and by Woody Guthrie and that album Mermaid Avenue. I think it, it'd be hard to overstate what an impact uh, he had on maintaining the 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 knowledge uh, and the music of Joe Hill into uh, the current moment that we're in. Um, I mean, by the same token, I'd say people like Utah Phillips and Ani DeFranco uh, in the latter 20th century, um, you know, very latter, you know, the last 20, last 20 years of the 20th century had a tremendous impact on, on keeping alive uh, the memory and, and the music. Um, but these were all sort of uh, maybe not inevitable that, that folks like Ani and, and Billy would, would, play those roles uh whereas when it's being passed on methodically at summer camp it's it's kind of more you know you know that you, people are going to learn those songs so either way it works in, in in these cases anyway well that was my last question i had for you i just want to thank you again for just being so helpful and agreeing to do this interview and answering all the questions on email my pleasure Gacko. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you. You've been good help. I'll just stop recording then. And.